outside my talk this semester in the Anthropology Colloquium series because of fall. Our theme this year is networks. Our speaker today, Dr. Gurdjieff Shamaraj, is currently a senior fellow of the Critical Writing Program here at UPenn, where she teaches courses on the informal economy in South Asia. Her research addresses the growth of informal economies and cultural transformations in India in the era of, global, era of globalization. She has also taught or is teaching courses on global foodways and politics of development, and the research embraces the network's theme in a very concrete sense. Dr. Chaturaj received her PhD from Yale University in 2010. Her dissertation, called Roadscapes, Everyday Life Along the Rural Urban Continuum of 21st Century India, is based on 16 months of field work conducted along National Highway 117, which connects the metropolis of Calcutta to rural and marginal areas in West Bengal. I had a little blurb summarizing the contents of her talk, which I was going to talk about, but I think given the intimate nature of this audience, we'll just let her talk about it. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rishabh. Thank you so much, Dr. Rishabh. this talk and thank you to the organizers of the Colloquium series for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and this is a, a paper that I'm currently revising for publication so I would really love any of your comments and feedback on it. Um, I look forward to receiving that. And this particular chapter, uh, this particular paper that I'm presenting is called from one of the chapters of my dissertation which examines sari embroidery in Southern Bengal which is a form of work that is growing along the highway that I studied. As part of India's neoliberal economic transformation, rural spaces are urbanizing in situ while peasants increasingly shift away from agriculture. In this paper, I examine the expansion of a vast informal industry of sari embroidery spreading along National Highway 117 from the city of Calcutta to rural West Bengal, which is a form of what I term rural outsourcing. This expansion has created new classes of entrepreneurs and workers, producing new wealth and opportunity. The industry also employs child labor and lacks state regulation or unions. Rural outsourcing thus combines prosperity and exploitation in a form of unfettered capitalism. I own a gray nylon sari, elaborately embroidered with swirling threadwork and raised gray beads all over its body, and decorated along its border and end with silver sequins. I bought it from Rubio Sheikh, a middleman in the sari embroidery industry, from the village of Kulpi. Kopi is a riverside village about, 20, about 78 kilometers from Kolkata. It is also a central location from which sari embroidery is spreading along large parts of rural Bengal. After I bought this sari, I watched as Bani, a middle-aged woman from the river island of Pathor Protima, handed a large bundle of embroidered saris back to Robiu. She was returning the finished saris that she had collected from him a month earlier to be embroidered by family and friends back in her village. Bani had taken two buses and a boat to reach Kofi, a seven-hour journey. She was able to undertake the trip because of improved connectivity, particularly bus transport, between her island and the mainland. Like Bani, thousands of men, women, and children across the South 24 Parganas district of West Bengal currently work in the sari embroidery industry for middlemen like Robil. Better linkages between Kolkata and the countryside are enabling, are enabling the production of elaborately embroidered saris and transforming ways of life in Kulpi and other villages in Bengal. With improved connectivity between village and city, sari production is outsourced from city workshops to village homes. These saris rarely sell in the villages where they are embroidered. Rather, they are consumed in urban centers where there is greater demand. The term for sari embroidery is jori kaj, literally metallic thread work. Jori kaj refers to the work of hand embroidering saris with metallic thread as well as with beads, stones, and sequins. In the South 24 Parganas district, artisans, middlemen, and their saris are moving back and forth in a nascent rural industry that relies as much on improved transport as it does on new forms of urban demand and consumption. Until recently, hand-embroidered saris were expensive and exclusive items sold to a limited clientele. They were produced primarily in urban work workshops, concentrated in particular areas of specific Indian cities, each with their own style, such as chicken embroidery in Lucknow, and chicken here refer refers to a particular form of embroidery, uh, specific to North India. In West Bengal, commercial embroidery work on saris used to be concentrated in neighborhoods within the city of Kolkata, such as Kidarpur. While such work still continues within the city, urban embroiderers now focus on more highly skilled embroidery work. Urban em 
embroidery workshops are given over to high quality stitching, often for clothes made for sale in Indian departmental stores, for Indian designers, or for export. Low end embroidery work has been outsourced to rural India. Expensive saris with various kinds of highly specialized hand embroidery, such as Zardozi, Kashmiri, Katha, and Parsi, among others, have long been on the market. What is new is the commercial demand for relatively inexpensive saris, which start for as low as rupees 150 or $3, which are covered in more generic or even lower skilled forms of hand embroidery. Anthropologist Claire Wilkinson Weber notes the, demands, the beginnings of this demand for mass market, low end embroidery, in her ethnography of sari embroidery in Lucknow, and writes about the transformation of chicken embroidery from a high skilled hereditary craft into an increasingly popularly performed and lower skilled one. In the last two decades, the rise in demand for cheaper embroidered saris has led to the growth of an outsourced, decentralized embroidery industry in rural Bengal. Complex distribution chains extend outward from Kolkata, where wholesalers in Warabajar source saris out to numerous, numerous distributors local, located in small towns which have the fringe areas of the city, such as Ampala. These distributors then outsource their saris to another set of middlemen, known as Ostagors, who either distribute size to individual workers who embroider in their own homes, or to groups of workers who embroider in shacks that serve as workshops built by the Ostagar. Ostagars may distribute size to workers who live up to 100 kilometers away. Indeed, an Ostagar I interviewed regularly sent his rivers to Shavadi, which is a river island in the Sundarbans that takes up to nine hours to reach from Kolkata. Finally, multiple middlemen may exist in this chain. For example, for faraway villages, a third level middleman often collects saris in bulk from the main Ostagar and then redistributes them, collecting his own cut in return. The return commodity chain of moving finished saris back from rural embroiderers to Kolkata and then throughout India is equally complex. Saris are embroidered, then returned to the Ostagar who passes them up to the chain until they reach the wholesaler in Borobadar. From there, the saris are sent on to shops in Kolkata or to other, other urban markets across India to enter the retail market. Whether back office software work migrates from the US to urban India, or embroidery shifts from urban India to the rural fringes, the logic of outsourcing is the same. Work moves to the places where it can be done the most cheaply. This movement is facilitated by ever improving technologies of transport and communication between the place where the work is being outsourced from and the place to which it is outsourced to. The explosion in bus connectivity between city and village in, in uh, West Bengal has enabled the growth of sari embroidery outsourcing, just as the electronic mediation enabled the software outsourcing industry. There are many cost advantages of the spread of joy cards to rural areas. First, wages are lower in rural areas than in the city. With a shortage of employment as well as liquidity in rural Bengal, people are willing to work for lower wages. In addition, space is at a premium in cities in India, so outsourcing production to the countryside results in lower setup costs for workshops, while with many people also embroider in their own homes. Rural workers are also more dispersed and unorganized. Informal small-scale industries are also often required to pay heavy bribes to state agents in order to function. Far from the eyes of the state, decentralized rural production avoids almost entirely any form of taxation, regulation, or collective bargaining. Joyakaj is ubiquitous in Kopi and the surrounding villages. People I spoke with there variously said that 99%, almost everyone, most people, either directly embroidered saris or had a fam family member who worked in the industry. They said that it was the most widespread source of employment in the area and that it had supplanted agricultural labor. While Jori Kaj has spread to other rural areas, some of the people I spoke with said that it had particularly spread in the South 24 Parganas district because of the lack of other employment opportunities in the area. NGO work undertaken specifically to spread Jori Kaj in the region and improved connectivity with the city. The production in rural areas of objects which are primarily consumed in urban India sets in motion a range of complex social transformations and messy cultural negotiations between actors from different communities with different approaches to urban consumer goods. In the case of sari embroidery and kulpi, these include the increased consumption of Bollywood media, higher rates of school truancy, divisions between Muslim and Hindu embroiderers, and a disapproval of the sari saris themselves in the places where they are embroidered. I attempt in this paper to draw out some of these complex and multiple interactions and processes which shape the production of saris and kulpi. 
Who then consumes these embroidered saris, and why has their demand increased so greatly? Consider the following description of an early 19th century royal costume worn in a Carnatic court. The embroidered killet of high value worn by the Nawab that day, and also the ornaments set with jewels, emitted such bright light that the world illuminating sun felt depressed. Who would not like to shine like the sun? Is it any wonder that as Indians become, earn ever more money and as Zari embroidery in rich metallic threads becomes cheaper, more people choose to drape themselves in these shimmering saris embellished with stones, sequins, beads, and crystals? Metallic thread embroidery, or Zari embroidery in varied forms, has long been a marker of royalty in India. Zari embroidery has denoted pomp, splendor, and status for the select few. At least from the 13th century, with the advent of Sultanate rule in Delhi and the subsequent Mughal era, Zari embroidery has become an indispensable marker of royalty, wealth, and prosperity. In Vithu Kumar's gorgeous book, Costumes and Textiles of Royal India, almost every royal costume pictured is embroidered through and through with gold or silver threads. Many include precious stones, some even have luminescent beetle wings painstakingly sewn on, and descriptions of royal clothes read like poetry. Clad in their glistening threads, the rulers literally shone brighter than all others. Hand embroidery displays the labor that has gone into producing it. Unlike the more cryptic world of fine textiles, where delicate turns of warp and weft are hard to read and trace, with hand embroidered fabric, every stitch and every sequin is literally placed by another person's labor, there for us to see. Embroidery is a form of embellishment where the social relations that produced it are laid most bare. It broadcasts to the world that we the wearer's ability to purchase the painstaking labor of another. Since the liberalization of India's economy in 1991, India's middle class has more than tripled in size to 250 million people. It has become commonplace to note that this growing, growing middle class is ushering in a consumer re revolution set to emerge as the world's fifth largest consumer market in the next two decades. Political scientist Leela Fernandez argues that languages of commodities and of consumption provide a potentially accessible array of cultural registers that suggest a possibility of access and participation in this new middle class model of the Indian nation. Consumption is also the means through which aspiring entrants to this new middle class can penetrate other barriers which obstruct class mobility, such as education and language. Consumption practices thus provide means of entry and alleviate anxieties about status. Adopting new forms of clothing is often a way in which to signal belonging and social status within a new class position. Tracing the history of, Lucknow chicken embroidery, of the Lucknow chicken embroidery industry, Claire Wilkinson Weber asserts that in the mid-1800s, a, a class of newly wealthy patrons began buying chicken to emulate the nobility that had previously worn it. This led to expanded production of chicken embroidery and dis different skill levels being employed in its making. Similarly, today's new middle class displays a growing desire for shimmering hand-embroidered zari saris, previously available mainly to India's elite. Hand-embroidered designer saris are increasingly popular with the rich and famous, including socialites and film stars. These saris are embellished with very fine embroidery and expensive accoutrements, including Swarovski crystals, seed pearls, and precious stones. Embroidered saris are reproduced in cheaper forms for wider consumption, some for as little as $3. Sari saris at the lower end of the price spectrum are relatively, are relatively new, targeted at people who would not have been able to previously afford this form of embroidery. The consumers are largely members of the new urban middle and lower middle classes. Just as new elites in Lucknow sought to emulate nobility by wearing chicken in the 19th century, members of the new middle class seek to emulate India's new nobility, film and te television stars, by adopting Zari Sari styles. As Mukulika Banerjee and Daniel Miller argue in their book, The Sari, the 2001 Bollywood film, Kabhi Kushi Kabhi Gham, or Sometimes Joy, Sometimes Sorrow, repopularized chiffons with intricate Sari embroidery. In terms of mass, mass sales, though, television soap operas now exert an even greater influence. Banerjee and Miller argue that Nim Su, the head costume designer for Balaji Telefilms, which make the highest rated soap operas in Indian TV, is the most popular woman in the sari world. Su chooses the saris, accessories, and jewelry that her characters wear, and on hit Saspahu or mother in law, daughter in law soap operas. When she champions a particular style of sari on a show, not only do those saris sell out in shops, but firms label and market their saris according to the names of the most popular characters on the show. 
While Sue varies her actor's looks according to the characters that they play, the dominant aesthetic on her shows is that of heavily embroidered synthetic fabric saris. The colors are bright, the embroidery mostly shiny with metallic sari threads, and the accessories rich and heavy. There is nothing minimalist about her look. Miller and Banerjee make the point that Sue's look is so popular because it is aspirational. The clothes on her show are what rich people wear and make the new soap opera world. They are novel and stylish, and they mark a break with more traditional sari styles. The availability of a previously high-end embroidered item at multiple price points necessitates the differentiation of merchandise, where a $3 sari can ultimately only superficially resemble a $1,000 one, as the quality of materials which go into them and the conditions under which they are produced are vastly different. For expensive designer saris, trained kari, there is an urban workshop, so small, high-quality stitches, which are monitored closely by overseers. The cheaper versions, which are produced in a de decentralized manner by lower skilled producers, sorry, the, the cheaper versions are produced in a decentralized manner by lower skilled producers with less, less stringent methods of quality control across the Bengali countryside. Embroiderers and Kulpi work mostly to fulfill this demand. The following sections of this paper examine the conditions in which these saris are produced. It seems oxymoronic to think of a product as being both handmade and mass produced at the same time. Usually handmade products are thought of as being intricate and of one of a kind, while machine-made products are uniform and mechanical. But a majority <coughs> of Zuri work, even though handmade, is a fairly low-skilled and generic form of embroidery which anyone can master. The aesthetics of these saris are remarkably unremarkable, considering that artisans labor over them for hours. They do not ex exhibit particular regional specialties or variations, as in old, older forms of folk embroidery. Their basic form is repetitive. A countryside which gives itself over to their production undergoes some level of de-skilling away from, a, from particular unique and local handicrafts, such as hand loom weaving or katha embroidery in West Bengal. By de-skilling, I mean engaging in forms of work which are easily picked up, require little training, and have few stages of skill for which to advance. These saris are the painstakingly handmade products of everywhere India. These handmade goods are being produced in a machine-made way, fast, cheap, and uniform. Many forms of artisanal production have undergone similar de-skilling processes. After India's independence, numerous government programs were set up to promote traditional handicrafts, the most prominent of these being cottage industries in the Khadi Gram of Yog, or Khadi village industries. In Kulpi, before the spread of Jori Baj, the traditional handicraft of the village was the production of woven slippers made from a particular kind of leaf. Demand for these saris was low, for these, sorry, demand for these slippers was low and prices were even lower. It was hard to make much money from them. So virtually no one in Kopi makes these traditional slippers anymore or knows how to make them. People who may have once have instead shifted to other occupations, people who may have once made them have instead shifted to other occupations, such as Jory Faj. Several Ostagars I spoke with complained of the lack of state support for their work and their difficulty in obtaining credit. Appropriating the language of the state, they were keenly aware that the government produced, uh, promotes cottage industries in rural areas. Hence, they argued, they should receive government assistance and loans. The Khadi Gram Udyog has been slow to provide assistance to the low-end embroidery industry, because even though it is rural, small-scale, and provides employment to many people, and produces handmade goods, it produces the wrong kind of thing. The Khadi Gram of Yog or Khadi Village Board was set up to promote traditional handicrafts, not flashy newfangled synthetic saris which imitate the clothing of soap opera stars. For the state, Jory Kaj produces the wrong kind of thing in the right kind of way. The industry generates rural employment, a much desired goal of the developmental state, without any state support, while state supported cottage industries often languish. Indeed, the industry is almost entirely unregulated and untaxed with production, consumption, and distribution taking place mostly in the informal economy. And, and I now talk about the middlemen who work in this industry. The term ostagar literally means a market master artisan or tailor. But Robil Sheikh, the ostagar from whom I purchased the sari in Kopi, was not a master artisan, and in fact he rarely embroidered saris himself anymore. Ostava remains the term that is used for him in the village, and the term he uses to describe himself. 
But Rubio could easily be called a middleman, an entrepreneur, a, desire, a designer, a subcontractor, an overseer, or even were he to work for a corporation, a regional manager, a networking officer, a junior executive, or an outsourcer. To an extent, Robio is all of these things. He performs all of these roles. The Bengali term for him is outdated and outmoded. It cannot capture the changing and multiple realities of his work and his world. Robio's father was a school teacher for many years until he left teaching, ostensibly to help his son in his business. For many in rural Bengal, becoming a school teacher is an ideal and a pinnacle of achievement. A school teacher has job security, a comparatively high and steady income commands respect in society and often holds political power. Robio's father wanted his son to also become a school teacher, but Robio was never interested in teaching. After completing his schooling, or finishing 12th grade, Robio took a course in air conditioner repair with a company in Kolkata. But upon finishing his air conditioning repair course, he was unable to find employment as a contracted air conditioner repair technician. He believes he was unable to find a job within the company which trained him because he was discriminated against as a Muslim. Frustrated and angry, he returned to his village. His father then began pressuring him to apply to the nearby colleges in Diamond Harbor for a Bachelor of Education degree to become a school teacher. Robiel refused and decided to start a business of his own. He had been noticing acquaintances in the village and nearby areas who were making a living by acting as middlemen in the sari embroidery industry that was spreading through the region. He decided to try his hand at it. Learning from an acquaintance, he initially began embroidering saris himself and then distributing them to one or two relatives. Robiel's father was appalled by his choice, his son's choice of profession initially, because in the hierarchy of occupations in rural Bengal, an Ostagor places below a school teacher or the work of the hand places below the work of the mind. But in globalizing India, as we can see in the case of Robio, blue collar can become white collar, a craftsman can become an entrepreneur, and alternate paths towards wealth and prosperity are created. Finally resigning himself to the fact that his son was not going to follow in his footsteps, the school teacher managed to arrange a marriage with a woman whose family was connected to the sari embroidery industry. The bride's uncle was one of the biggest Rastagars in the town of Amthala, located just outside of Kolkata. Robiel's wife brought with her valuable knowledge and contacts in the sari embroidery trade, from trustworthy wholesalers in Borobaja to embroidery techniques and best practices. Robiel was thus able to benefit from a well-established network, which he continues to develop. He, he sent his saris to villages thousands of miles away, as far off as the river islands of Prakhar Gautima and Shavali. He deals in several hundred saris a week, and his business is growing. Robio's father said, I used to think he was a good for nothing, but now I see that he is our future, that he was looking very far ahead. In addition to managing a chain of distribution and embroidery, Robio also acts as designer, always on the lookout for all that is new, the latest fashions, new designs, colors, and styles of embroidery. He gets ideas from magazines put out by design houses, TV, visits to Kolkata, movies, and from his imagination. He says that the competition can be bested only by staying a step ahead with innovative ideas and good designs. Even though he works in hand embroidery in rural India, he is not concerned with the traditional and the local, but rather with the new and the national. He makes consumer goods that can be sold in urban markets anywhere in India. Robiel's ambition and his drive are palpable. He is an example of a new kind of rural entrepreneur, of middlemen in villages who are taking full advantage of India's booming consumer demand to play a part in the production and manufacturing of small-scale goods. Robiel's income allows him to live an affluent life by village standards, and his shiny new Hyundai Sancho car is a symbol of his recently earned status. He and others like him bring an emerging middle-class consumer lifestyle and more high-end consumer goods to the village. And the purchasing power that workers get from their embroidery work also contributes to an increasing circulation of low-end consumer goods within rural areas. This phenomenon reverses an older narrative of rural migration to urban areas for work and opportunity. In the cases of Jori Kaj, urban work chasing comparative advantage has moved to rural areas. And villagers, both rich and poor, have a new avenue through which to remain in their own villages while gaining some form of employment. Some who work in the industry, like Robiel, are rejects from urban markets, and Jorikaj becomes a fallback <coughs> option to which they can return. Robiel's career choices have also allowed him a new kind of political space in the village. 
The Communist Party of India Marxist has held power in the state of West Bengal continuously from 1977 until its spectacular defeat in 2011. In that time, it built a powerful and efficient political machine, with many of its most loyal middle class cadres being school teachers. Teachers pay the price of an almost mandatory membership in the teachers' union and an all but mandatory support of the ruling party. School teachers I spoke with privately expressed their anger and disgust over the fact that they had to regularly attend CPM rallies and events when they loathed the party and were entirely opposed to its recent actions. In their hearts, some of them even passionately supported the opposition to the Amul party. They felt unable to freely express their political choices and locked into an oppressive party machine. When bright and ambitious young people in rural Bengal become school teachers, as Robil's father had wanted for him, they become tied to a political machine of the ruling party. But by working as an independent operator, as a rural entrepreneur, tied to neither party nor union, Robil is able to express his political views and organize more freely. Indeed, his, his room was strewn with anti-CPM pamphlets, DVDs, and a large pro trinamul poster, which is the opposition party. Robil's particular position as a rural entrepreneur, middleman, manager, exploiter, one that is growing increasingly common across the state, allows not just for new forms of rural consumption, but also for a new kind of rural bourgeois oppositional politics and leadership in West Bengal. I now look at the question of a middleman versus an entrepreneur. When I was in school in India, in both the social sciences and in literature, the middleman was a universally reviled figure, someone who was always seen as both exploitative and useless. Middlemen were social ills, a group of people who produced nothing but prevented markets and consumers from giving farmers and artisans fair and full prices for their goods. Middlemen, middlemen were seen as extortionists. Indeed, this view of the negative role that middlemen play has informed government policy across sectors, from agriculture to handicrafts, and has led to the setting up of institutions such as state agricultural boards and the Kadi Gram which aim to give craftsmen and farmers fair prices and access to the market. Middlemen were to be replaced with disinterested bureaucrats. Within India's socialist and developmentalist ethos, middlemen were viewed squarely as a problem and as a source of poverty. As Claire Wilkinson Weber argues, the government frowned upon any sharing or subcontracting of work. Subcontracting was viewed as an unqualified evil, and middlemen were regarded even more sternly than co commercial shopkeepers. Within a ne neoliberal framework, the former view of middlemen is changing and is open to interpretation. Many people who previously would have been now called middlemen are now seen as entrepreneurs, risk-taking, wealth creators, and innovators. Consider management guru C.K. Prahlad's argument about the difference between middlemen and entrepreneurs in his much lauded The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. In a case study on the carpet industry in Jaipur, Prahlad first critiques middlemen, saying, Middlemen have historically been entrenched in India's rug industry, depriving artisans of their deserved income. He then goes on to argue for the positive effects that entrepreneurs have on the Jaipur rug industry after drawing the following shaky distinction between middleman and entrepreneur. The main difference between entrepreneur and middleman is that entrepreneurs usually start out as weavers, and some continue to weave, middlemen generally do not weave, and are generally more closely aligned with the company's philosophy, generally passing due credit onto the weavers who work on their looms. This 46-word sentence contains generally three times and one usually. What can, we we, what can we then definitively say about the middleman who is critiqued and the entrepreneur who is celebrated for bringing growth and prosperity to rural India? What difference is there between the two terms except for a rhetorical one? Can one individual embody both, both traits depending on the ideological orientation of the observer? Is the shift from middleman to entrepreneur just one of ideology? Or is it an example of on the ground change where new types of actors are created as the incursion of the market and better connectivity creates new opportunities in rural areas. Robiel is an entrepreneur. He brought industry to an area that previously had little. He provides work to hundreds. He manages and coordinates a group of workers living across a vast geographical space. He attempts to improve his managerial practices, and he's also a designer. Robiel's role, which was decidedly negative in one economy, which was socialist and developmentalist, becomes the positive driving force of the second, capitalist and neoliberal. 
But where does a world of unmediated direct-to-consumer sales exist, except perhaps in the idealized world of Amway? With uneven education, resources, and market access, getting rural goods to urban markets requires multiple uh, interventions and actors in almost all cases. Wilkinson Weber notes that in her work, many embroiderers saw government handicraft boards as just another middleman or mahajan, working for whom had some benefits and some costs, not much different from laboring for private middlemen. Within state boards, such as Khadi Rama Bureau, middlemen exist, they're government bureaucrats. Within a corporate structure, perhaps they have middle management. In a neoliberal economy, then, middlemen can be read as entrepreneurs. With a shift in ideological position, an actor's roles can be re re be read from being redundant to pivotal. What does not change is the exploitation at all levels of the commodity chain. People in the area call the embroidery industry one of number one cheating, where workers live at subsistence level and are routinely deprived of their due earnings. Robiol and other Asagos make money off the labor of others, and a majority of them, including Robiol, employ children. There is a small rectangular makeshift brick structure with a tarp and tin roof behind a government school in Kulpi. One of the teachers at the school told me that the room is a place where people work on Zari embroidery during the day, and where I could conduct interviews. To reach it, you walk behind the school and cross a makeshift wooden bridge perched above a deep but narrow drain. A local Ostaga rents the place, and workers come here and work together. I cross the narrow bridge leading to the workshop, ask if I may enter and step inside. I'm surprised when I see a room full of 14 children looking back at me, their ages ranging from about 6 to 15. The children work in three groups on three saris, one orange, one pink, one green, each one stretched taut in sections across a wooden frame. I expected that the workers would all be women. We are all surprised to see each other. I tell them that I'm a researcher, explain my project, and ask them if I can ask some questions. The children invite me to sit down. A boy called Joy Leap answers most of my questions, with others piping in from time to time, agreeing, contradicting, adding stories. Joy Leap is not the oldest boy among them. He looks to be about 12 years old, but he is the most vocal, and seems to be a leader. Joy Leap tells me that he has been embroidering for over five years. He learned embroidery by himself through watching his mother and sisters. He says that his mother and sisters embroider at home, but he likes working in the workshop together with his friends, because one feels lonely in the house. He works seven or eight hours a day. The children all work six days a week with Sunday off. More and more people are coming into the field, he says, so the peace rate is decreasing. One to two years ago, it was rupees 10, at least for an hour of work, which is about 21 cents. Now it is coming down to more like rupees 7 or 8, which is 15 to 17 cents. This is too little and we want to leave. But now I only know how to do jewelry work. If I could find any other work, I would leave this. I left school of my own free will, but also because there was a need. I used to annoy, enjoy this initially, but now. The embroiderers earn between rupees 70 and rupees 90 a day, which is less than the state's stipulated minimum wage for unskilled workers in the handloom sector of rupees 94 a day. I ask what they do with the money, and another boy answers, we give the money to our parents, but we also keep some pocket money. Six of the children in the room said their fathers were unemployed. One had left school and regretted his decision, but was unable to go back to school because no school would admit him. Many of them said they had eye problems, that their eyes burned and watered from hours of intense concentration on needlework. The room has windows, a fan, and naked light bulbs hanging off electric lines in the ceiling. There is no overseer to brutally force them to work, but if they do not produce what is expected of them, they are paid less than their expected hourly wage. They say again that there is a lot of cheating in the business. While the work is exploitative, pre preventing from them from getting even a primary education and wearing out their eyes, their place of work is not oppressive. The boys seem to enjoy being here. As Joy Deep says, as people who live together in a family or shangshar, we work together like that. We enjoy coming here and seeing each other every day, even though I do not like the work anymore. In the left-hand corner of the room is a large flat-screen TV. There is a DVD player underneath it, and next to it a DVD of Race, a recent Bollywood hit film about horse racing among wealthy Indians in Cape Town, South Africa. The boys rent the TV, DVD, and DVD player from a local video store every Friday, and together they watch a movie. They prefer Hindi films over Bengali films and have fun together while watching them. Several children say they have been working here for five or six years. There is a really small boy standing near me, and I ask him how long he's been working here. Oh, around five or six years, he says, echoing his elders. 
Ha ha, he's six years old himself, someone says, and we all laugh. This is hilarious to all the children, but inadvertently, through his desire to mimic his elders, he brings something to sharp relief for me. What is the difference between working from the age of six and working from the age of one? The use of child labor in the sari industry in Kofi is deeply troubling on many counts. First, this industry has created new laborers. These children have not moved from full-time labor of one kind, say agricultural, into sari embroidery. Prior to the rise of the jewelry industry, most of these children did not work seven to eight hour days. School teachers I interviewed in Kulpi were extremely distressed over the rise in truancy rates in the area as a direct result of sari embroidery. Many of these children used to attend school and may have continued to do so as sari embroidery had not entered the village's attending source of income. Thus, while it provides them with pocket money, sari embroidery attracts children away from accessing even a primary education. The penetration of an industry that employs child labor in an area leads to the employment of more and more children, where earlier they may have had non-laboring or quasi-laboring lives. The story I have presented thus far is of successful Asthagars who have attained material wealth and are re relatively far more wealthy, wealthy than other people in their villages. But the Asthagars, but other Asthagars I interviewed live under a cloud of fear. They fear that the industry which they brought to rural Bengal to improve connectivity with, with Kolkata will be eclipsed through the city's connections to other places. They struggle to keep up with the vagaries of fashion and worry about abrupt faddish changes in demand of embroidered saris going out of fashion and of the collapse of their livelihoods. And the top, top Oslagars fear most of all the disappearance of their trade entirely. Already there are threats to the production of the cheapest low-skill forms of jewelry work, jewelry work. Embroidery machines have recently come into use in Gujarat, which can produce saris of the same quality as Bengali hands. The machines can even reportedly sell set sequins and have the possibility to, to make the entire sari work business in rural Bengal obsolete. This is a key fear in a low-skilled handicraft industry, as opposed to a very high-skilled one, where work is replaceable by machines. As one Oslagar said, we can't compete with a computer. One embroidery machine costs rupees 70 to 80 lakh, but in Gujarat they are buying them. They will start buying them here. Big Marwaris can afford it here. Big Marwaris are buying everything, and small businesses will get hurt. A quiet, melancholic man, he seems to be mourning the inevitable demise of his industry. His words have an almost theoretical quality, predicting the eventual supersession of his system, even while it, it is at one of its most thriving phases. We can't compete with the computer. The melancholic Ostagor's worries sound familiar. The expansion of small-scale industries into rural areas through private entrepreneurship is perhaps not only a case of rural growth resulting from a globalized growing economy and its increased consumer demands. Neither is the fear that these industries of, of these industries being superseded by machines. Rather, these processes seem to be a key feature of capitalism and echo forms of industry and labor in 19th century England. Indian billionaire Mukesh Ambani is the head of Reliance Industries, the largest private enterprise in India. He is keenly interested in ways in exploring ways in which to expand his business into the country's rural markets. In a New York Times profile which ran in 2008, he, he champions a new and what he calls a creative form of production which holds immense promise for India and could even make it a competitor for China. From the New York Times piece, Mr. Ambani is indeed thinking beyond his current portfolio. One of the more intriguing ideas swishing around is a quixotic plan for making India a rival to China in manufacturing. The Chinese model consists of large factories in urban areas, populated by millions of migrant laborers who produce goods at cheap rates. Similar efforts have lagged in India because it remains difficult to acquire land for farmers here, because corruption hinders large infrastructure pro projects, and because red tape remains so sticky. Mr. Ambani's vision is to turn India's weakness on its head. If manufacturing remains small-scale and fragmented, let it stay that way, he says. The next big thing is how you create manufacturing with decentralized systems, he says. The Chinese have got very disciplined top-down systems. We have our bottom-up creative systems. He mentions products like handmade leather sandals from the sugar belt a few hours south of Mumbai, tie-dyed bandhani size from Gujarat, artisanal pottery, clothes, jewelry, and the like. These wares would be produced in rural areas, sometimes in a villager's own home, Reliance, his firm, would forego manufacturing them and instead teach residents what to make, gather the wares from disparate villages, and oversee quality and market and distribute the products. 
The sari embroidery industry is but one example of what Mukesh Ambani terms a bottom-up creative system. The difference between Ambani's vision and currently existing systems of rural outsourcing is that he seeks to corporatize and bring under his reliance industries the many, many small-scale dispersed industries that multiple entrepreneurs and middlemen slash operate across India through rural outsourcing. Nonetheless, what emerges through Ambani's call for rural-based manufacturing and through my study of sari embroidery in Kupi is that rural outsourcing is a currently observable phenomenon and one that can be tapped to improve Indian manufacturing. India's economic liberalization has increased linkages between rural and urban areas, and previously urban-based jobs are being outsourced to rural areas at accelerated rates. The growth and acceleration of rural outsourcing along routes of connectivity is something that can be observed in globalizing millennial India, and this process is transforming rural economies and culture. Yet the process that has accelerated and expanded in India since economic liberalization has an older and disturbing parallel. What I term rural outsourcing, or Ambani's bottom-up creative system, is another iteration of a far older manufacturing form that coexists with industrial production, which Karl Marx termed domestic industry. Marx describes domestic industry as a complement to industrial capital. Focusing on the lace-making industry in 19th century England, he argues that domestic industry is constitutive of industrial capitalism. Rather than a whole-scale shift to mechanized production, he, Marx says, the system actually prevalent in England is this. The capital co capitalist concentrates a large number of machines on his premises and then distributes the products of these machines among the domestic workers to work it up to its finished form. Here we see the exact process at work in the jewelry Kaj industry where machine-made synthetic saris are distributed across the countryside to be finished in people's homes. Those who are not employed in factories or who are rejected from urban labor markets end up toiling in domestic industry. Domestic industries are those which do not as yet compete against machine and factory products, such as lace making and straw making. The joyfage industry is a domestic industry, at least until the dreaded embroidery machines take over. Certain aspects of Marx's description of lace making could well be a description of Jory Kaj. Domestic industry is scattered, dispersed, and handmade, spread across a wide geographical area. For Marx, domestic industry reproduces all the negatives of wage labor with none of its possibilities. Rural and dispersed, it is necessarily more exploitative than a factory system because it extracts labor out of children and women, has no regulation, no possibility for unionization and is characterized by unhealthy conditions, low wages and long hours. Even though machine-made options are available, handmade domestic labor systems continue to be used because they were profitable due to the greater exploitation of the workers. But as competition among producers increases, conditions among easily exploitable women and works are easily exploitable workers steadily worsen. In this case, consider the complaints that children made of steadily reducing wages. Wages go down and hours go up until finally, as Marx says, a critical point was reached. The basis of the old method, sheer brutality in the systematic division of labor, no longer sufficed for the extending markets and for the still more rapidly extending competition of the capitalists. The hour of the machine had struck. With it, domestic industry entered the factory system proper. What does it mean for millennial India to exhibit, exhibit modes of production similar to those which were prevalent in 19th century England? How can we consider the striking similarities between the two instances without drawing on discredited theories of modernization and industrialization and placing India on the stately progress towards modernity, modernization, development on the Euro-Western model, as Dorian Massey puts it? The growth of rural outsourcing in India at this moment is clearly not a step along the way to its ultimate industrialization. Rather, in this neoliberal moment, the spread of rural outsourcing emerges in the wake of India's incomplete process of industrialization, at a time when urban industry is actually on the wane, and formal factories across India's cities have been closing down, from Ahmedabad's textile mills to Kolkata's jute mills. As formal industrialization and manufacturing slows in India, rural outsourcing and informal and small-scale production in factory and workshop units increases. Thus, there is no determined teleology to the growth of domestic industry and post globalization India. It is not a stop along the way to full industrialization. Rather, it is the face of manufacturing in much of the country and is an extreme form of dispersed exploitative capitalism with little organized factory productions promised for workers' protections and solidarity. 
is rural outsourcing then to be celebrated as a form of production which has generated growth and much needed employment in rural areas? Is it to be condemned because it is inherently exploitative? Is the growth of domestic industry in neoliberal India positive or negative? I argue that for now, perhaps it is enough to say that rural outsourcing is, that it is a rising form of production in, in India, which has deeply transformative effects on rural space, economies, and lifeways. Spaces in rural areas along routes of connectivity are urbanizing in situ through forms of rural outsourcing, while people are increasingly shifting away from agricultural production and can, and can, and can no longer be thought of as peasants. It is important to pay close attention to the forms outsourcing takes in rural space and the transformations it engenders as India's economy continues to grow. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, we do have some time for questions. <coughs> Thank you for the fascinating paper. The, obviously, the, uh, one of the questions I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to is, you know, why uh, people would migrate over from you know, the peasant kind of activities that, that they do to you know, what you're saying is you know, virtually sweatshop kind of labors there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, are you trying to peg it to uh, the neoliberal uh, ideological shift at the level of the government? And so how exactly would that work? Mm -hmm. And also, did you actually you know, interview people who are still in the peasant condition to find out you know, what they think about it. You know, what do they think about their lives? You kind of give us a description of the life in the sweatshop, and you know, why would they move over? So I'm kind of curious as to how you're reasoning about all that. Sure. Thanks for that question. Um, I think that the reason that people have been migrating over is that a majority of people who work um, in this industry do not have significant holdings of land themselves. So they wouldn't necessarily, they might have small holdings when they do gardening for pumpkins or things like that, but they don't have land holdings, so they would work as labor in other people's fields or other people's farms. Um, there's a, a crisis of agriculture in Bengal where basically you have diminishing returns to agricultural production, you have smaller and smaller land holdings, and basically the, the rates of pay for people who work in the agricultural sector are far lower than people who work in these forms of sweatshop labor. So even the government rate of 94 rupees for unskilled labor in and looms, that's the government minimum wage, the government minimum wage for unskilled labor in uh, the agricultural sector, I believe, is around rupees 80. So even if we go by the state model, there's a difference in, in prices um, in West Bengal. So I think because people can get higher wages in this sector, uh, because their previous forms of employment probably within agriculture were not particularly um, were not particularly lucrative, there is definitely a wage incentive that makes people move over. I think uh, some of the other things that might be working in terms of sort of the neoliberal ideological shift is that you, you I think what I was really seeing in Kupi is a shift towards um, a consumer lifestyle at many, many different price points. So you have the, the middleman ma middle who's buying a Hyundai Sancho, but you also have uh, embroiderers who are buying cassettes and um, you know, who uh, like renting TVs to watch Hollywood movies and who are participating and who see themselves as connected to uh, this consumer revolution want to participate in it in some way, and so they simply earn more money through working in these sweatshops, which tells you about wages in West Bengal, and then they use that money to then become consumers as yeah. more consumers. I was asking you simply, you know, obviously the miserization hypothesis within Marx doesn't quite exactly fit, you know, the data that you have there, right. so it's uh, an interesting situation. Right, right, right. it is definitely. Um, and I haven't talked to a lot of people who are still farming, actually, so that's maybe one of the places to go. It's, uh, you know, so sort of what, what do they think about all these people who are now working as sweatshop labor, essentially? This was fantastic. And I, I, I was especially excited then about this, this um, the, the ending, this, this question in comparison with 19th century England. Um, and and, um, and it, it makes me think, actually, that, that we simply just don't have access to what was going on in 19th century England on some level. Um, but, uh, I mean, so if it's not, uh, I, mean, in, I mean, you could argue that even 19th century England wasn't a step to industrialization. It, I mean, they had the advantage of colonial territories to sell their products to and the slave trade to plug into. You know, that, that, that made all kinds of primitive accumulation possible through that, which, um, which this industry doesn't have. I mean, it's an interesting reversal, right? They're now selling to 
But, um, and, and, and then there was a big, you know, uh, um, an invisible die-out that occurred when, when that crisis of the machines that, were, that, that the guy is predicting actually occurred, right? And people had to leave their, their, their villages, end up in the cities, and basically become alcoholics on the GM. Just, you know, there's a, there were several generations that, that we just completely forget about that just got wiped out in the way, you know, whatever, the way what's happening in the, <coughs> in the 80s with crack or whatever, yeah. um, or, or right now in Philadelphia. So there's some huge processes of lumpenization that, that attend to industry, you know, that, that occur with industrialization. And it seems that it must be different now with this extraordinary surplus of population, what you mentioned in the beginning, the digital age, mm -hmm. age of transportation, <clears throat> and then consumer culture. But just, and, and that's just a comment that there was someone who presented a few weeks ago um, a, 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 an interesting rural industrialization um, uh, ethnography on, on the highlands of Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And what was amazing to hear is the exact same sort of statement that you would never hear in Marx, because mm -hmm. you know, they didn't do that kind of field work. Um, uh, the um, where that it, in this case it wasn't it, it was it's so much fun to go to the factory because it's so boring at home mm -hmm. and uh, and so in this case they were they were hiking every day two or three hours to a rural village you know to that shack that you described except it was bigger and, and you know with more machinery and and so forth but there was. You know, there was some dimension of the alienation and idiocy of rural life that, that in, in, in this case, the women identified it with being liberated from traditional female roles that didn't allow them to ever talk to anyone, you know, outside of their little tiny, uh, you know, place where they're living. But it's fascinating to be looking at this and then, you know, and, and Rorschaching back onto 19th century England and then being in the present. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, I think that just the question of, of primitive accumulation in India, one of the theorists of political economy and contemporary India, Frank Vitality, is arguing that um, the difference between, one of the big differences between now and then is at the same time that you have um, expanded primitive accumulation and this danger of creating a, you know, ruthless, lumpen, uh, you know, population which is, you know, completely set out from whatever basis of livelihood it had earlier, is that at this moment the Indian state and democracy can't allow that. So what you see is a two-pronged process where you have increasing primitive accumulation with um, the growth of India's economy, where, you know, as I would put it, India is kind of colonizing itself in some ways. And, but at the same time, you have massive welfare programs from the Indian state, probably the largest that you've ever had in terms of um, a 100-day right-to-work program and various different kinds of programs which are seeking to reverse the effects in some kind of way at the same time. Now these are, uh, you know, some people would argue that the state's effect to reverse prim primitive accumulation are like the poor houses or the sort of the work houses or, um, you know, the sort of these very, very, these forms of uh, reversing primitive accumulation which keep people basically at really subsistence levels of, um, of livelihood but prevent them from becoming completely rootless lump and mass, right? So, I think that those two processes are ongoing, but I think one of the things that's happening is that people are also, private individuals are creating new forms of work simply in these cracks between the two processes. Thank you. Thanks so much. I was interested in what you were saying about the middleman, mm -hmm. and especially the middle, the, the middleman as a historical figure, as, as uh, you know, kind of an ocean attached to mm -hmm. To you know, the one who keeps uh, keeps the market from moving freely, etc. But that's also been emphasized in particular ways and been stigmatized um, globally. And I was interested particularly in what you were saying about uh, the the new sort of uh, position of the middleman vis-a-vis -vis the state. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that because in some way it sounded like you were saying that they were no longer uh, as beholden. Because of the position, they were no longer as beholden in aid to party politics and union organizing, so that kind of developmentalism. Mm -hmm. But then I wondered, you know, what is the role, and then what does that mean in terms of people's attachments or understandings of, you know, their political worlds? So could you say, could you say more? Absolutely. Um, I think that. 
um, in West Bengal in particular, with this really specific history of 35 years of communist rule, which has always been really, really strong within rural areas, um, what developed over the last 35 years was a system where basically people, there was one game in town, and people who were in power in rural areas participated in that game. So most school teachers um, were loyal supporters of the Communist Party, um, and many, uh, even in present day, who did not particularly want to support the ruling party felt that they had to. They had to turn out, they were members of the teachers' union, and they had to turn out for rallies and events. Um, and this was sort of a, a constant conversation that I had with the, ho the host family that I was living with in Diamond Harbor. Their daughter was a teacher who wanted to support another party but didn't feel like she could because of uh, the, the obligations to sort of fit into that party machine. Um, so right at the time when my field work was taking place, the oppositional party in West Bengal was rising for the first time in 35 years because of you know, the parts of the story that I left out in this chapter, because uh, the Communist Party was behaving very, very uncommunist and wanted to kind of expand in industry in West Bengal by acquiring um, farmland for various kinds of industries, specifically car making and a chemical hub. And there was a lot of protest against this. Uh, they wanted to build special economic zones. And as a result of those protests in 2007, 14 people were killed when they wanted to keep the state out of um, their uh, village in Nondigram. And as a result of that, there was a popular upswelling against the CPM, which led to their being voted out of power in 2011. So I think that um, Robiel and different middlemen, when I went to their houses, I didn't really interview them extensively about this, but they were all Trinomal supporters. And they were all Trinomal supporters uh, because they were outraged by what had happened in Nondigram, because they were able to develop, they had the space to sort of openly voice what their new political views were. And they had a lot of anti-CPM uh, sort of materials and propaganda in, in their homes. Um, so really, they were able to eke out a new space of political organizing and leadership because they weren't beholden to older uh, political party structures. And um, in fact, one of the things that I maybe can argue if I do more research is basically that this entire area is a, is a really major uh, area of production for sari embroidery. A lot of the embroiderers um, had anti CPM stances, and this before the CPM was voted out in 2011 from the state, they lost panchayat elections in, along this highway in this area, in the South 24 Parganas. So I think there's a linkage there that I need to sort of push more and figure out more about. But um, but it, it, it allows for people to have a position in the world that isn't linked to the political party and to the state. And does that then filter out from the Yes, I think so, because basically, for example, um, if you're working for a middleman who is also not beholden to the CPM and is pro Trinamul, as opposed to maybe a landowner who is pro CPM, you're, they're, they're new kinds of uh, actors and games in town, and you're able to more freely express those political views. Hey, um, uh, I was not in the kind of question, but this is a uh, short uh, comments about uh, your comparison between the uh, China and India. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe uh, in a contemporary situation, and you can say uh, the industrialization of China uh, is uh, heavily dependent, is heavily uh, based on the uh, state uh, finance, the uh, heavy industry or industrial complexes of uh, all the areas. But uh, as far as I know, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the uh, capitalist industrialization of China nowadays, uh, the beginning was not based on the urban area, but was based on the rural area. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of China's specialists, and they said uh, the oldest form of the uh, enterprise in, in the capitalist enterprise in China, they were based on not the urban area, but based on the uh, village or township level. So they call it the village and township level enterprises. And, and uh, some statistics that say that, especially in, uh, in the late uh, 80s, uh, the rural area shows about uh, close to 18% annual uh, capital increase, while uh, the urban area shows only uh, the one third of that weight. So, uh, I mean, the implication is about this. I mean, the charge of peasants uh, is not as backward as uh, many uh, people they uh, consider. I mean, they are rational, as rational as the capitalist or urban people. And insofar as they could get some uh, proper motivation or proper resources, and they can take uh, take advantage of all of the uh, the, uh, the resources, and they could uh, be in our head of the, uh, the urban uh, 
people or like residents. Uh, so, uh, and then my question is about, so how about, how about India? I mean, uh, you, you, you constantly use the, uh, the term known as peasants, mm -hmm. but in, in China, uh, there's kind of a distinction between the peasants and the farmers. And uh, people use what to say uh, farmers when they think uh, those in the countryside, they're as irrational as the, uh, the urban people, educated people. Mm -hmm. But uh, some people who uh, believe uh, those in, in the rural area, they are backward and not educated, and they want to call them peasants. Is there any distinction uh, between the peasants and farmers in, in India? And what do you think about the role of the peasants? They are just the victims of the, such kind of, of the, uh, just, just the tidy uh, appropriating uh, system, or they have their own rational and uh, they have the ability to develop by themselves or something? Great. Mm -hmm. um... So I think the comparisons with China and the growth at uh, the Vision Township level and enterprises is something that's fascinating to look into because I think it might be um, a similar story that isn't looked into in India. Um, in terms of peasants, I, the, I actually use the term I think a few times. I use it in the beginning and I use it in the end of my talk. Um, and it's kind of a framing device to, to think about the way people look at people in rural areas within the scholarships in West Bengal but also in India and the way that, the things that I see when I do my field work, right? So I absolutely don't think of peasants as in any way specifically or significantly different than people in urban areas as less rational as less, I think they're as rational or irrational as any more than anywhere, right? I think that, you know, um, sort of a lot of new economic theory posits that nobody is a rational actor and everybody's a rational actor, right? Um, so I don't see that distinction, but that distinction has been used in the scholarship and as a way to understand people who live in rural India. Uh, primarily, there is a, a link to agriculture, but I obviously can't use the term farmer because most of the people that I'm talking about do not farm. They are not farmers, right? Um, they would be considered pe peasants because they live in rural areas because they have a connection to agrarian lifestyles. They're not urban citizens and also uh, they're supposed to have, I think, supposedly different dispositions, attitudes, ideas, ways of being. Um, I don't, didn't necessarily see significant distinctions between people in both spaces. One of the things that I noticed in my research, because I was working along the highways, that people are moving increasingly back and forth between spaces, that there are uh, definitely dif differences between the way people live in cities and the way that people live in villages, but the same person often has lived uh, a lifetime in both places, right? So worked as bonded labor in, or oh, sorry, worked in, uh, as uh, wage labor in the city and then moved back to the village to retire and now runs a van sure there. Um, so actually, I think I'm sort of in favor of not using that term anymore. Um, and, and the reason that I used it twice was really to sort of push this idea that we can't think of people in villages as peasants anymore, whatever that term may, may mean, especially because they are completely or increasingly disconnected from farming as the primary form of uh, income and as the basis of life. Uh, I'm wondering, uh what are the implications of using the word outsourcing in, in this sort of complex geographic game? My own research is about uh, at the emphasis of the urban rural, and for cities like Delhi, the urban indexes very closely with the rural, and there is no uh, sort of uh, uh, spatial mm -hmm. distinction. And we also know from um, Louis Dumozak's essay on from Mungo to Maine to Srinivas's essay, Indian Village Myth and Reality. To debates with Pokov that that this uh, the construction of the village as, as a generic self and close and stable community is a colonial construction and how uh, and how things on the ground are really very different from that since mm -hmm. since migration flows are not new uh, uh, the contribution of the village the so called village economy to the urban economy or the large economy is, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, so I'm wondering how, in, in your research, uh, you use those categories. Uh, I'm also wondering if uh, the emergence of these industries in rural areas across the highways mm -hmm. is really new, uh, because as far as I know, uh, in the heydays of uh, mercantile sort of capitalism in the urban centers like in Bombay and Ahmedabad, mm -hmm. as you mentioned in your research, um, sort of guild-like production units inside <coughs> my uh, fr from migrant labor's ancestral homes in the rural areas were always used to supplement income. So I'm really wondering what the sort of demographic profile of these people involved in these industries is today. Has the, mi has the male migrant labor moved back into this industry or is it 
merely their wives and children who are making these surveys. Uh, I'm also wondering, uh, I, I have done some research with uh, smaller entrepreneurs in uh, rural areas uh, as a marketeer, and uh, um, um, sort of corporate India has realized that it has saturated middle class and lower middle class India, and they really need to go to what they call the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, so Nokia funded this research that I did, uh, which, and they call these people mini premiums. Uh, people who are not really entrepreneurial, don't have that kind of capital, but are somewhere in the middle. And I, and I realized during the course of that research that people are using telecommunication technology to really bypass the middlemen. Uh, farmers, uh, fishermen are able to contact the, the wholesaler in the city directly and you bypass like five chains of uh, middlemen. So did you, did you see uh, any of those kind of things happening um, in these areas? Um, so two things. The, the, in terms of the newness, um, is this a new form of production? I don't know if it's a new form of production. What I do know is it's a relatively new industry. So uh, everyone that I spoke with identifies somewhere between 15 to 20 years where people basically started working in a very large scale inside embroidery. And that was almost a unanimous thing. So the exact date, the reason I use the term new, which is a vague term, is that the exact date or how long people have been working in sari embroidery for urban markets, these types of saris, this specific form. So we're not talking about katha or craft gills or you know, uh, handling saris. We're talking about uh, zari embroidery on synthetic saris, which then go to urban markets. That's quite, I, you know, I can quite mark that. So that's not new. As a form of production, is it new to have people producing things in rural areas for urban space? I haven't done a historical study of it, but really what I'm focusing on is this particular industry. Um, the reason that I uh, use the term outsourcing is because, you know, most people think about the globalization of India's economy and think about call centers in cities, right? That this is sort of the dominant narrative or image that people have. And really, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that sort of the growth and expansion of India's economy has had these effects across a long space, right? That isn't just contained in uh, urban area too. So it's not a U.S. to uh, sort of Delhi relationship. This is a process which has effects along long stretched out places. And um, in that sense, it follows the same logics as what we call outsourcing for call centers, right? Where work moves to where it can be done most cheaply. It moves from where it was, where it used to be done, right? Which in Kolkata is Kidipur in areas concentrated a, a lot around the city. Again, we're not talking about kind of more traditional forms of broker embroidery, but sort of embroidery for large consumer markets. So it's moved from there to rural spaces, uh, which I'm not positing in any way as, you know, closed village communities. I'm really saying that they are continuously in contact with the urban, but that a specific form of work has moved from urban workshops to this long stretched out place along networks of connectivity. I think, um, but I, you know, I think the, the, the mini-preneurs, and sort of I'd love to talk to you after about sort of the work that you've done with, um, with market research and this idea that there's a huge fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, but I think your last question was about, I've written down new markets, but I think I've lost my... It was a related to many things, so we can have that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Nice. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, no, thank you so much for all of your questions. This is very interesting. Thank you.